Brother Paul. Thank you, sir. Good morning, church. Good to see you this morning. Glad that you're here. The evidence of you being here means that you didn't eat too much turkey and dressing for Thanksgiving. What a wonderful blessing. What a wonderful time it is to spend uh, spending time thanking the Lord for that which we have received and that which we have been given. The Lord reminds us that we are to be folks that are to be thankful. Paul several times in his epistles, either admonished the readers to give thanks, or he set the example by saying, I give thanks early on in his epistles. And so we're mindful then that we're to be thankful people. And we spent this month of November reminding us that we need to be thankful. We've talked about thank you, Lord. We began the, the series off with, and then we thank the Lord for our family. We thank the Lord for the church. We thank the Lord for his grace last week. And this week, as we close out the series, we want to thank the Lord for our thorns. Matthew Henry was an individual that... Now, Jay, I don't know. What did I do? Well, you know, we'll just, all right, we'll go without it. <laughs> we'll just go without it. Matthew Henry was a Congregationalist. He was also a Presbyterian preacher in the uh, late 1600s, early 1700s. Matthew Henry was robbed. And when he was robbed, he sat down and he wrote a, a little piece about it. And he said, I thank you, Lord, for the fact that this was the first time I'd ever been robbed. I thank you, Lord. The fact that even though they took everything that I owned, it wasn't that much. I thank you, Lord, for the fact that they took what I had, but they did not take my life. I thank you, Lord, for the fact that I was robbed, and I did not rob. It's often difficult to thank God for the bad things in our life, for the thorns. The thorns hurt, don't they? And as they hurt and as they cut into our lives, we don't like those thorns. We don't like those difficult things. We don't like those problems. Thorns have never been pleasant. It was sort of like when I was a child growing up. My parents believed in spanking, discipline, corporal punishment, spare the rod, spoil the child. So they didn't believe in sparing the rod. They believed in using it. And they used it when need be. And my dad said, and for you, son, that was quite often. But nevertheless, discipline was never fun. I never looked forward to being disciplined. And yet, I think as I look back on it and then having the experience of raising uh, Ethan I understand the importance of discipline. And so while we may not like thorns, we may not like difficulties, we may not like heartaches, we may not like hurts, we may not like tribulations, we may not like the pain that comes in a life in which we live and in our lifetime, the reality of it is is that they are there, but yet they work good for us. And so as strange as it may seem, And as difficult as it may seem to be at times, we need to thank the Lord, yea, even for the thorns that appear in our life, whatever they may be. But we have to ask ourselves, why? Well, that's sort of the the reason I want us to look at this lesson this morning. Lord, we thank you for our thorns, because our thorns, first of all, give us a sense of perspective. They give us a sense of of where we're going and where we're headed. It would be easy, if you really stop to think about it, to fall in love with this world, wouldn't it? I mean, the world itself is really nice. It's beautiful. There's things to do. There's places to go, things to see. In many ways, it treats us full of, of fun and full of, of things that, that bring enjoyment and laughter and wonderful peace to us to a degree. And so we could enjoy life. But, as the song goes, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. 
You see, pain, suffering, thorns, hurt, allow us to gain perspective that says, oh, wait a minute, I, I'm not here forever. That's not the intention. That's not God's intention. If you think about it, how was man made? Man evidently was made immortal. But when he sinned and was cast out of the garden, thus not having the right to the tree of life, never to be able to enter into the garden again, according to Romans chapter 5, death came upon the world. Death by sin. And so... Man now lives a few years. The psalmist says that we may live to be 70 years, and if I, by re- reason of strength, 80, but then we're soon cut off and we fly away. We do. Pain helps us to say, oh, wait a minute, this world's really not all it's cracked up to be. It looks good, sounds good, tastes good, seems good, but it's really not that good. Peter reminds us that we're strangers, that we're sojourners. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. That we are folks that are just passing through. We're not here forever. Pain, thorns, help us focus on that idea. Well, then if there is something else, and truly there has to be something else, and the Bible says that there is, and we believe the Bible, then truly I need to live my life in such a way as to understand that I need to live beyond this life. Paul would write to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians. And one of the one of the emphasis in the book of 2 Corinthians, while in 1 Corinthians he's trying to help a church that is splintering and fussing and fighting, in 2 Corinthians one of the things that Paul's addressing is pain and suffering, and problems, and afflictions. And he says in the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians, verse 17, Our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, works in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things that are unseen, but the things that are seen. But what does Paul tell us about the things of this world? He says those things are passing He said, those things will soon be no more. For we know, if you continue to read in chapter 5 then, in verse 1, that if the earthly house of this tent is dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now go back to verse 17 of the fourth chapter. What does Paul say about our problems? Our light affliction is but for a moment. He says, our problems are really not as big as we make them out to be. And admittedly, what's my problems are big and what's your problems are little through my eyes, right? But Paul says, just in general, when you stop and think about it, my light affliction is but for a moment. But then he says, my light affliction, which is but for a moment, does something. It works in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Because we look above. It is, and it, it is those, those difficulties that provide the impetus to make us to move, to make us to want to serve God, to make us to want to follow God. While some would say pain is the ultimate argument against God, I would say pain is the ultimate argument for God. Why? Several reasons. First of all, why is it pain if there is no such thing as true good and God is true good? Second of all, it helps me. God helps me get through that pain. And God helps me get through those difficulties. God helps me get through that suffering. And so, I need that perspective for the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory of heaven. That's what Paul reminded the church at Rome in Romans the 8th chapter and verse 18. 
You see, we, we gain a, a better perspective of life and an understanding that we're not here forever. The Hebrew writer talks about all of these great folks of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And you know, it says that by the time you get to verse 13, the Hebrew writer's already talked about uh, Noah. He's already talked about Moses. He's already talked about Abraham. He's already talked about Enoch. And guess what? He gets down and he says in verse 13, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And they were persuaded what? Well, if you'll let me paraphrase, (laughs) he said they were persuaded there were better things. There were better things. Stephen Hawkins, a noted astrophysicist. You may not be familiar with him, but if you ever watched The Big Bang, he was the man in the wheelchair that was very deformed. He had ALS. A brilliant mind, the only thing that... uh, I know of that was really that I did not like or prefer with him was the fact that he was he was an atheist and very outspoken in his atheism. But Hawkins suffered for many years in the wheelchair, suffered from ALS, as we said. Hawkins was asked one day about his life, and he said he was quite content and quite happy. And they asked him, how in the world could you be quite happy and quite content? He says, well, when you when you realize that there's nothing to this life, and you pull all your expectations down to zero, he said that anything then that happens is a plus. When we begin to have all the pains of this life, we begin to see that really what it's doing is it's polishing us up, making us better, helping us to understand we're not home yet. But we're headed in that direction. But then secondly, Lord, thank you for the pain. Thank you for the thorns because they lead us to repentance. You might say, do what? Without pain, many folks would not repent. It's only when we're met with the stark reality of, first of all, as we said, the perspective of where we're headed, but also the stark reality of what's going on. And so, if you will, God has to to get our attention. I think two or three months ago I told you the story of a man by the name of Charles. Charles passed away. I knew Charles about 22, 23 years ago. I came across Charles. He was a member of the church that I was with at the time, but he was a shut-in. I did not know of his situation. I walked up one day. I knocked on his door. I was going to visit him. I heard this voice. Just a minute. And so I waited at the door. In a minute, someone came to the door in a wheelchair. I was invited in. Charles invited me into the living room when I, after I told him who I was. And, oh, yes. And he'd already heard me on the radio, and he knew that I was the preacher, or the, the associate preacher for this congregation. And so <clears throat> we sat and talked. Charles' speech was very difficult to understand. It was slurred. It was was not always coherent. He spoke very loudly. In the conversation, I come to find out that Charles had had several severe strokes, and that had created his disability. One day, I was visiting Charles, and he he said, Brother Paul, and I, I can tell you, on that day, I can tell you where I was sitting, where I was. I was in his kitchen. Brother Paul, yes, Charles. If it took this for God to get my attention, it was worth it. My life was lived for myself until I realized where I was headed. And because of my pain, because of my strokes, 
My wife had always gone to church, always taking the kids. And I, I had, you know, I was in and out. But this got my attention. And it straightened my life up. You see, we need to thank the Lord for our thorns because it's there that we wake up. Jonah really woke up when? When he was down in the mouth, so to speak, right? That's when Jonah really woke up. That's when we see our problems. Peter reminds us in 2 Peter chapter 3 of those that were scoffers and those that were living according to the world. And you know what they were saying according to verse 4? They were saying... Where is the Lord's coming? For since our fathers, it's always been like this. We've always been waiting, if you will, for the Lord's coming. And He's never come. And He's not going to come so we can live like we want to live. There are those that would hold to that. But I would hold that in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our problems, we need to understand that we're not sufficient. Job even said in Job 6 and verse, 30, or verse 16, he says, he says, is my strength within me? And the answer is no, Job, it's not. For Paul said our sufficiency is not in ourselves. Well, where is it? It's in God. Well, sometimes God has to, if you will, tap us on the shoulder and say, hey, wake up. You need to understand where you are, and you need to understand who you are, and you need to come back to the one that can take care of you. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, and He heard me. Psalm 18 and verse 6. In our problems, in our difficulties, in our heartaches, in our hurts, we need to understand that it's simply God saying, come back to me. For no chastening at the present seems to be joyous or joyful, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, it's better for us. That's what the Hebrew writer reminds us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. You don't have to enjoy it, but you have to know that it works good for you. It was Hezekiah that was told by Isaiah in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 20, get your life in order because you're going to die. And he turned his face towards the wall and cried out in prayer to God, God, I've been loyal to you. What are you doing? And God spared his life. But God got his attention, didn't he? And evidently, the sickness that he had, it was called in the New King James, if you keep reading, it's called a boil. He told him, it, Isaiah told him how to take care of that. You see, problems aren't fun. Problems aren't, aren't something we, we really want. But as Paul learned in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talked about his thorn in the flesh. We, Here's the question everybody wants to know. What was Paul's thorn in the flesh? I have no idea. I have read books, and I have read people that have said they know what Paul's thorn in the flesh is. Some have said that it was his ugliness, his grotesque-looking physical features. Some said that it was his bow-leggedness. I read a book, and I know you're going to question it. You're going to ask me. Don't ask me. Ask the author of the book. Here's what he said. Paul's thorn in the flesh was his mother-in-law. Now, I know you're going to, there's some questions about that, I, but uh, I said it. I don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Was it his eyesight? It's always been assumed that it was his eyesight, and it seems as if he did have poor eyesight, but I don't know. But whatever his Paul's thorn in the flesh was, Paul said that three times he asked the Lord that it might be taken from him. But God answered, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. We know that part of those verses, don't we? But have you ever read verse 7? Oh, I know you have. But sometimes we forget verse 7. Paul says, because of the abundance of revelation, 
there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And he says, lest I should be exalted above measure, there was given me that thorn in the flesh. Paul says, what? Paul says, because I had such a hand and God had revealed so much to me. He says, this thorn in the flesh was that which humbled me and kept me down to earth. And so, in so many ways, Paul could thank the Lord for his thorns. For they kept him humble. And they led him to a life living with God. Lord, thank you for my thorns. Because not only do they give me a perspective, but they lead me to you. And relying upon you and your will, your comfort, and your strength. But then thirdly, Lord, thank you for my thorns because they build character. They build character. You might say, well, if that be the case, I'll just be a character. I don't want any character. We have to understand what thorns really do. They prove us. We're put to the test to see if we're really what we are and who we say we are. Someone has once said that people are like tea bags. That you have to put a little hot water on them to really see the kind of tea that's in the tea bags. So you have to put a little hot water on people to really see really how they are and who they are and what they are. When we look at that, we ask ourselves, is really... is. Should, does God, shouldn't He comfort me? Why does He have to build character? Well, we know that in order to, to develop ourselves, we really have to, to, to train ourselves, right? We want big muscles, what do you do? You go to the gym. You want uh, good lungs, what do you do? You exercise. You want strength, what do you do? You build up. How in the world could we be stronger morally? How could we be stronger in our relationship with God? How could we be better people? People that have more courage, more perseverance. People that have more endurance. People that are willing to stick with God. And people that are willing to show others the truth as they are fully committed to God. By exercising those muscles. By being built up. And how is that done? Well, it's done through problems and pain and suffering and heartache and hurt. And disappointment. The Bible reminds us in Psalm 48, verse 10, or excuse me, Isaiah 48, verse 10, Isaiah the prophet reminds us one simple idea of God. I have chosen you, or I have proved you, out of the furnace of affliction. God, you, some, something's wrong here. Uh, something's wrong with this picture. To, to think that, that you would really want me to go through heartaches and hurt. But the reality of it is, is God does not care about our comfort. God cares about our character. And God cares about our relationship with Him. That's what God cares about. And so, we're made better. Are we really? Well, that's what Paul said in Romans chapter 5. He talks about how that, that problems, persecutions, yet perseverance, perseverance, tribulation, tribulation character, character, hope. In other words, here's what we are. And here's how we're made better. By problems. By friction. By God, if you will, through, through the th- problems that we have in this life and the difficulties that we have, allowing them to make us better. We know James chapter 1. But can we apply it in this particular instance? I believe the answer is yes. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, I do better, right? Sure. My brethren, listen to James chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. Count it all joy when you fall into various temptations, knowing this, 
that the trying of your faith works patience. That's what James reminds us. The, the trying, the difficulties, the heartaches, the hurts, that they really work something better in us. Little boy and little girl were climbing up hill, brother and sister. And brother was getting ahead of the, the sister, and she hollered out. She said, she said, slow down. She said, I can't get over all these bumps. She said, they're in the way. And he hollered back at her. He said, the bumps are what you climb on to climb up the hill. Bumps are what we climb on to climb up the hill. So thank you, Lord, for your thorns. For I realize that they're making me better, even though I may not realize it. But then thank you, Lord, for my thorns, for they really teach me to help others. Not a person goes through this life without some sort of pain and some sort of problem. A baby that is born into this world will cry and cry and cry and cry. And the doctors want that, to dry out those lungs, to get all that mucus and all of that that out of their system. And as he goes through life, there will be many more trials. As they go to grade school, there will be teachers in the way. There will be tests. There will be some bully, some beautiful girl that will break his heart. As he gets to his teenage years, there will be a mama and a daddy that are standing in the way of his or her personal freedoms and personal liberties and and therein have become, if you will, a dictator. They'll go off to college. They'll learn that they can't stay out all night and do all various things and, and keep mom and daddy happy because they're spending a tremendous amount of money to get them through school. They'll get out of school. They'll get a job. They'll realize that that job won't pay for that brand new house and brand new car and all the clothes that they want. And then they'll start their family. And then they'll see the trials of trying to raise a family in the way that they think best. Their parents will die. They'll be faced with a mountain of debt physical ailments and problems, and then they'll grow old. And as they grow old, the body will hurt. The body will not function the way it's supposed to function. There will be days in which they just simply cannot move, and they cannot move forward. Until finally they'll take their last gasp. Oh, preacher, aren't you so positive this morning? No, I'm telling you, that's life. But that's life for everybody. You might say, preacher, you wrote my book right there. You wrote my life story. That's everyone's life story. And Paul reminds us, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comforts, who comforts us in all our tribulation. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, verse 4. That we may be able to comfort them. Who's the them? The them that are going through troubles. That we might be able, if you will, to, to offer up the kindness, to offer up the love, to offer up the compassion, to offer up the help, to give them what they need. For Isaiah 41, verse 10 Isaiah wrote of God, Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I'll strengthen you. I'll help you. There's comfort in people. But there's comfort in people being able to come and wrap their arms around us and say, I understand what you're going through. And for us to really understand that they do understand because they too have walked in those shoes. And so thank you, God, for my thorns, because they 
develop within me that empathetic heart that says that I can go and help those that are going through life's difficulties just like I've been through them. God, I really don't like my thorns, but I realize that they're really for my good. That they, they, they do give me a perspective. That they, they really do help me understand and draw me closer to you. That they really do make me a better people, better person. And they really do help me want to help others. Habakkuk chapter 3, the very last verse there, the last verse of, of that book. Prophet makes a statement. He says, God's my strength. He will make my feet as deer's feet. And he will help me walk in his paths. The old deer there is the old mountain deer, the old mountain goat we might liken it to. You ever watch them maybe on TV or maybe you've seen them in person? How that even on the steepest of hills they can walk and seemingly walk without problems. Better than some of us can walk on flat ground. And so the old prophet saying, God makes my feet strong so that even in my mountains and even in my difficulties, I can walk up those mountains and he'll give me the strength to walk in my paths. Thank you, Lord, for my thorns. Because you're a God that will get me through it. Where would a sailboat go? and How would it go if it were not for the wind? What would be the song of the stream if it didn't have pebbles and rocks in its way? I don't like problems. I like peace. I like calmness. I like consistency. I like things to go well. But Lord, when those storms come, thank you for them. And may I grow because of them. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful for the opportunities that we have. And the opportunity this morning that we've had to worship you. And we're thankful for the fact that even though we don't like these problems, and we don't like these difficulties, Yes, in many ways to us, we view them as being potholes of discouragement. That we realize that we can turn to you and you'll help us through them. And you'll allow us to grow because of them. We're thankful for them. We're thankful for all the blessings that are ours. Realizing that with you, we can get through life. And realizing that because of you, We do have life. Watch over us, bless us, and keep us. Forgive us of our sins, for this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. This morning, if you're not a New Testament child of God, or you need to change the direction of your life as a child of God and ask for the prayers of the church, you might say, Preacher, that was not an uplifting sermon. I hope in many ways that it was, because I hope it will get you to sing. That with God, you get through. Won't you come? Why together we stand and sing?